Just a quick word of warning before we begin. In this episode, we describe with some detail photos of sadomasochism. So if you have children in the room, you might prefer to listen with headphones. Imagine you walked into a museum and the walls were covered with black and white photographs. I know, museums have a lot of black and white photographs, but not like these. These photos were vivid images from New York's gay S&M scene. They show things like men peeing on each other, men fisting each other, the photographer's self-portrait with the handle of a bullwhip in his rectum, and that's just a few of them. These photos were exactly what Dennis Barry saw in 1988. I actually saw a version of the exhibit at the Whitney Museum in New York and really thought it was a great exhibit. Back then, Dennis was the director of a museum in Cincinnati. He was viewing an exhibit called The Perfect Moment, a retrospective of Robert Maplethorpe's life work. Maplethorpe had become famous for his groundbreaking and envelope-pushing photographs of gay S&M and African-American nudes. But in 1988, Maplethorpe was dying from an AIDS-related illness. The retrospective was created to celebrate his life's work, and Dennis thought his city should see it. And I said, listen, we'd really like to take this show in Cincinnati. As luck would have it, they could squeeze in one more city. The show was supposed to go to Houston, and at the last minute, Houston decided not to do it for reason, any reason I do not know. Anyway, I said, we'll take it. And uh, that's how that all started. Cincinnati was the fifth stop on the tour, but before the photos had a chance to get there, something happened. When they reached Washington, D.C., family values organizations began to protest. They said images of gay S&M do not belong on museum walls. Soon, conservative politicians jumped into the fray and started pressuring the museum that was slated to exhibit the photos to cancel. And they did. They caved to the pressure. Do you remember where you were when the news broke? Oh, I remember vividly where I was. (laughs) I was at a meeting of the AAMD, the American Association of Museum Directors. And uh, everybody in the room was pretty uh, shocked because they hadn't heard of such action in forever or in a long time. And the guy next to me who ran a contemporary art center in San Diego turned to me and he said, do you know anyone who's taking that show? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, you are so screwed. (laughs) And I thought, oh my God, I am. I'm Matthew Billy, and you're listening to Bleeped, a podcast about censorship and the people who stand up to it. Because sometimes free speech comes with a price. By the 1980s, Cincinnati had earned itself a bit of a reputation. Law enforcement had a history of enforcing the Ohio obscenity laws. You know, you don't have... um, the hardcore pornography being sold. You don't have the mate swapping clubs. That's Monty Lobb. At the time, he was the president of a family values organization called Citizens for Community Values. We had over 16, 17,000 quote unquote members. We philosophically believe that hardcore pornography hurts individuals, desensitizes men, it hurts relationships, okay? Do you remember how you found out that the Maplethorpe exhibit was coming to Cincinnati? Yeah, I'd gotten some pictures sent to me, given to me, and say, hey, this has been going on in other cities. We hear that, uh, you know, they're going to be coming to Cincinnati probably sometime next year. I mean, immediately, the ramifications, like, whoa, you know, we're not talking paintings, we're not talking sculptures, we're talking photographs of actual people doing things, much like you'd find in pornographic magazines. Monty warned his organization's 16 or 17,000 members that the Maplethorpe exhibit was on its way, and if they wanted to stop it, they should write a letter to their government officials saying something like this. We believe that this is the material that's going to be coming. If you feel like it violates the higher Revised Code on obscenity, you know, we encourage you to prosecute. The rallying cry went up against the photo exhibit that it was anti-family. Hundreds turned out to protest. Hundreds sent letters to the prosecutor's office. Dennis Barry, the person you heard in the intro, was the director of a museum called the Contemporary Arts Center. He'd lived in Cincinnati for a while and seen family values groups protest all kinds of things. Magazine shops, plays, movies. But he'd never seen anything like this. That campaign then came with it was an onslaught that we were not prepared for, quite frankly. 
my understanding, my that they sent out something like 30,000 letters. They sent these to all sorts of people and a lot of civic leaders. That's when the tide began to turn against us. The Contemporary Arts Center was under attack. There were protesters outside, corporate sponsors were running for the hills, and the museum didn't know what to do. So Dennis called an emergency meeting with the board of directors. We brought out even more copies of photos from the exhibition and showed them to all the board members and said, this is what you're defending. One by one, Dennis laid out the photographs on the boardroom table. Pictures of a man fisting another man's anus. Maplethorpe with a bullwhip lodged in his rectum. A man urinating into another man's mouth. A cylindrical object being inserted into an anus. And two nude portraits of children, to name a few. I won't say that it was an easy moment. It was not. They looked at a few of those photos, and I think they were aghast. Then after the shock wore off, Dennis made his case. And I said, I will resign if they are not comfortable with taking the exhibition. Because I thought it quite honestly violated the First Amendment, the rights of a museum to show what it thought was important to show. And then the board members put it to a vote. The overall sentiment in the room was that we have to be true to our institutional mission, which is to show contemporary art, no matter how problematic. All the board, it was unanimous, voted to uh, keep the exhibition on our schedule. Before the meeting was adjourned, the board made one more suggestion in case things got messy. We did have a couple of lawyers on our board. They said, listen, there's a good firm right here in town called Sirkin and Mezabob. The firm had a long history of fighting First Amendment cases. Well, they came to talk to us and they were concerned about what could happen and could they be prepared as to what to do. I'm H. Lewis Sirkin. I'm a practicing trial lawyer. The board and I were very happy to have them come on as in our defense. An exhibition of Maplethorpe's photographs has been touring the country. It has now reached Cincinnati. The exhibit opened to our membership the night before, and we had long lines on an April night that turned out to be a snowy night. I remember we went to a a restaurant after the opening, had a few drinks, and we kind of all sighed that nothing had happened. I went home exhausted and then got up the next morning thinking, well, it's just going to be another morning. An hour or two before we were scheduled to open, I went down to the Contemporary Arts Center. I mean, there were just a few of the staff there, and, and we had long lines waiting to get in. I can't remember the actual numbers. It was staggering. But after the exhibit opened, the Contemporary Arts Center wasn't the only building in downtown Cincinnati that was busy. Our courthouse is normally closed on Saturday, and there were people that we had scouting up there to see if the courthouse was open and whether there was any activity going on. And apparently there was. We found out that 12 of the initial (laughs) first people that came in The Contemporary Arts Center were accompanied by a member of the sheriff's department who had brought them in, and they went through the exhibit. The 12 people looked at the photos, and they went back to the courthouse and convened a grand jury. They were asked to decide whether or not the museum violated the law by displaying Maplethorpe's photos. The judge called and said that there had been an indictment. In Cincinnati today, a local grand jury indicted the center and its director on obscenity charges. Charging that seven Maplethorpe pictures on display are obscene. And one of the reporters told us that the sheriff and the police chief were in an office somewhere debating who would move against us. It turned out to be the vice squad of the Cincinnati Police Department. I received a call from the presiding criminal judge of that month. He gave me his home phone number that I could call him in the event that we needed to get a bond set if anybody were physically arrested. We kept getting like minute by minute reports from the media about where the police were and, you know, they're five minutes away, they're two minutes away. And of course, then they, they ultimately came in. So what happened when they got there? I met them at the door and uh, 
They said they were closing the exhibit and wanted all people out. We had hundreds of people in the gallery. The place was packed both inside and out. It started a great deal of, a te- of tension, anger. It got almost violent. It really did. There were people that quickly created signs that said all kinds of different things about censorship and were comparing our local sheriff to Hitler. While the police went about their business, a huge crowd made its feelings clear. I was asked to speak to the demonstrators, which I did, and said that, you know, we're not closed forever, that we will reopen, and uh, they're not seizing the photographs. A local judge refused to sign a search warrant that would permit them to seize any of the material. They were only allowed to photograph and take videotape. And they closed for about a, you know, an hour while they videotaped the exhibition. After the police finished filming the exhibit, the museum reopened and people came back into the gallery. The police may not have stopped anyone from seeing the photos, but they made their point. The saying, there's no sin in Cincinnati, drew new breath. This self-proclaimed clean town became the first city in American history to prosecute a museum for pandering obscenity. This time, the whole world is watching a city which, after Robert Maplethorpe, will never be the same. So what was it like living in Cincinnati at this time? Cincinnati is explosive at this time. This became an issue that absolutely divided the city and was on the front page or or on the 5 o'clock or the 11 o'clock news every day. There was never any reprieve. Art on trial! Art on trial! Art on trial. That's what the 200 protesters outside the courthouse were saying, and they were saying art on trial is an outrage. No art police! The protesters marched in front of the courthouse for two hours, then went into the middle of Main Street and stopped traffic, doing things deliberately designed to shock middle America. There were protesters throughout the city, mostly supportive of us or supportive of gay rights. I'm freezing to death, but inside my soul is burning. We should not have to be standing here fighting for our rights. It should automatically be ours. Many of the demonstrators supporting the museum were LGBTQ activists who felt that these photos were not being called obscene because they featured S&M acts. They were being called obscene because they featured only men doing them. In the conservative community, which is Cincinnati, the gay movement has not been particularly vocal politically in years gone by. But what happened here today is obvious proof that that is changing. I'm here because I'm queer and I'm mad as hell about all this. We feel that this issue is such a strong one that we had to, to make our presence here. Shame! 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 And if you listen to the comments some people were making at the time, you'll hear what kinds of things the LGBTQ activists were up against. What should the criteria. role of art be? The role, the role of, art. of art. The is role a of art is a cultural thermometer. Well, there are those who are saying some of this art is a rectal thermometer. That's the problem. <laughs> if this is considered art this year, then what's next year's art going to be? Is it going to be sex with animals? Is it going to be sex with dead people? And the debates over the photos weren't confined to just Cincinnati. People all over the country were arguing about a surprisingly complex question. What is art? Is it art or is it diarrhea? <laughs> Actually, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next half of the show. Is it art or is it garbage? We had been inundated by national and to some degree international press. So we had reporters from the New York Times and Time Magazine and CNN. And and they looked at Cincinnati, which had this history of being very conservative. And they saw this as the perfect place to fight this culture war. And the culture war was fought through a national debate over whether taxpayer money should be used to fund the arts. The controversy exploded over an exhibition by the late photographer Robert Maplethorpe. It was partially paid for by federal funds from the National Endowment for the Arts. Controversy has erupted between the art world and Senator Jesse Helms, the nation's most conservative senator. Helms thinks, for example, that Robert Maplethorpe's photographs are obscene. What he wants, basically, is the Senate to take action to cut the funding for the NEA. Now, if artists want to go in in a men's room and and write dirty words on the wall, let them furnish their own crayons. Let them furnish their own wall, but don't ask the taxpayers to support it. 
But even with all the criticism, people still lined up to see the photos. Ironically, the effort to stop people from seeing the entire show has made the Maplethorpe exhibit the hottest ticket in town. It has been the most heavily attended art exhibit in Cincinnati's history. Ultimately, the exhibit played uninterrupted over the three-week period that it was here. We had record attendance, I think 80-some thousand people. That would be like a year's attendance for us in you know less than two months. Our membership soared. But for Dennis's personal life, all the attention wasn't as positive. I remember at one point I took uh, my kids to see a movie and the people behind me just wanted to talk about Maplethorpe. And my kid, my one kid started to kind of cry and he said, won't they just leave us alone so we can watch the movie? And I mean, it was, you know, it was always a part of life. We were bombarded by phone calls, by threats. By threats to my children, those were the worst. Uh, You know, that they were going to kill my children. My wife, you know, she was at home for these phone calls. She was very strong and stood up very uh, courageously. That is not to say that these things don't take their toll. They do. I remember at one point the police said I should wear a bulletproof vest and always kind of monitoring where our children were. So, you know, it was a little scary. Why didn't you ask the art center to take down the photos? I really thought this battle was so important to the future of American museums. I thought if we lost, the doors were wide open for even greater censorship. In a Cincinnati courtroom today, lawyers for a local art museum and its director pleaded not guilty to obscenity charges. There were two charges against him that were both misdemeanors. That's the lawyer, H. Lewis Serkin, again. Pandering obscenity could have carried up to 180 days in jail and or a fine of $1,000. And then there were the pictures that involved the two children that were claimed to be depictions of minors in a state of nudity which also carried a sentence of six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. So combined, Dennis faced up to a $2,000 fine and a year in prison. The Contemporary Arts Center, which obviously couldn't go to jail, was charged with the same two crimes. They faced up to a $10,000 fine. So how were you planning to defend them? We were really working on the third prong of the Miller test. The Miller test is a method the Supreme Court put together to determine if something is obscene. It asks three basic questions. First, does it appeal to a person's prurient interests, meaning does it elicit lust? Second, does it depict sexual conduct as defined by state laws? And third, and most important, does the work lack serious literary, political, scientific, or artistic value? It's a conjunctive test, so it's got to be all three. And if it fails on one of the three parts, you know, the material is protected speech. The art form involved in this case and the serious artistic value is the quality of the photograph. So basically, H. Lewis had to prove that the photos were actually art. Opening arguments were heard in Ohio today in the case of the first art gallery in U.S. history to be tried on charges of obscenity. What is the limit? Where do you draw the line? Regardless of who the defendant is, regardless of where it's displayed, where do you draw the line? Art is not always to be pleasing to our eyes. Art is to tell us something about ourselves, to make us look inside ourselves, and to look at the world around us. So how are you going to prove that the photos were art? We plan to bring in several directors of art museums throughout the country. But strangely, picking which museum directors was a little more complicated than you'd think. You know, we're a Midwestern city. If we brought in experts from New York or California, they may not go over so well here. And even picking directors who are actually from Ohio could be risky. We also, we've always been in rivalry with Cleveland. Uh, And, you know, to bring in somebody from the Cleveland museums, again, we thought would not be a, there would be the problem. Even at that time, the rivalry between the Bengals and the Browns and the Indians and the Reds and, and all that, we just tried to avoid that. So Lewis and his partner Mark Mezebov selected directors from three museums to testify. The Museum of Art at University of Michigan, the Getty Museum in L.A., and the Kodak Museum in Syracuse. Each took their turn on the stand, explaining why Maplethorpe's photos were art. 
It was called the perfect moment for the reason that Robert was known for getting the perfect lighting and the perfect setting and taking the, the picture at the perfect moment. And that was really where he had this such strong artistic ability. So how did the prosecution try to prove that the photos lacked serious artistic value? They brought in an expert whose name was Judith Reisman, and she had formerly been a songwriter for the Captain Kangaroo show. Judith Reisman was sworn in as an expert in visual arts and pornography, mostly because of one item on her resume. The Reagan administration gave her a $750,000 research grant to analyze visual images in magazines, specifically 10 years' worth of Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler. So even though her art background was a bit tenuous, she could rightfully claim that she'd looked at more pornography than anyone else in the courtroom. She truly came out of left field. She was somewhat dramatic and spoke very much with her hands. Some of her testimony was just absolutely bizarre. The prosecutor asked Reisman to explain why each of the seven photos were not art. We weren't able to track down audio of her testimony, but to give you an idea of what the jurors heard that day, here's a recreation of some of it. Now I want to direct your attention to the photograph with the cylindrical object inserted into the anus. Is there any message conveyed that this action is acceptable? Well, yes. You see, with the absence of emotion, with the absence of pain, which would take place when one is putting an object of that size into one's rectum, one then receives the information that this is an appropriate activity because it is in a museum. And then the prosecutor's focus turned to one of the two photos of new children. This one was a boy named Jesse. A series of pictures of Jesse was taken by Robert at the request of Jesse's mother, when he arrived at her flat in New York, Jesse had just come out of the shower and was romping around, and he was standing on the couch, and one of the pictures that Robert took was Jesse standing on the couch. And behind Jesse in the photo is the kitchen. You can see a refrigerator, an electrical cord, and some random lines on the wall. And in your studies to determine the focus on genitalia, did you look for certain cues in photographs? Yes, we did. And what cues do you see in this particular photo of Jesse? There is a pyramid. The lines focus on the child's genitalia because the entire background is white. He is white. The lower body sits perched on a horizontal line, which is in the beginning of the black chair. She focused on how every line of the photograph pointed to their genitalia. And when she said that, and with her hands waving and describing this, you could just see the courtroom and the jurors and Everybody kind of, you know, the look in their, on their faces like, what in the world is she talking about? Virtually everybody in the courtroom started to laugh, including jurors. <laughs> and the judge got very annoyed. That was a classic moment. After two weeks of testimony, both sides rested and the jury began its deliberation. We still didn't think we were going to win. Just because the history of the, of the community in being supportive of censorship, you know, Cincinnati just had a history. You never know what a jury's going to do until they return it, but there's always a great deal of anxiety. I think the deliberation was on a Friday, so we really didn't expect them to come back. The Cart House was maybe about five or six blocks from the Contemporary Arts Center. So the staff and I went back, I think my wife, we went back to my office, just sat around, and then the phone rang like two hours later. Get back here, they've reached a verdict. That means two hours, Nobody, and no one expected it to happen in two days. So we had to literally run back. <laughs> those five or six blocks to the courthouse. So you're jogging through the streets? Yeah, we're jogging through the street. We didn't have Uber in those days. All the news media, I don't think, I don't know, they had all you know gone to a bar or something. So everybody had to run, run back. We're jogging, we're jogging through the streets, you know, probably out of breath. So we, you know, we were nervous, <laughs> absolutely nervous when we walked back into that courtroom. After a two-week trial, there was a verdict today in the celebrated prosecution that pitted the nation's arts community against so-called community standards. 
We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn to find the defendant not guilty of pandering obscenity. Oh, it was great. I mean, I felt that I'd won the Super Bowl. The thrill of the victory of that, I mean, it's so special. Vindication, elation, you know, it's a great feeling. It really is a great feeling. And what did you do after? Did you party? Oh, yeah, yeah. we got really drunk. <laughs> and where did you go? You and I can't remember. I think we, we went out with a few friends, and uh, we got very drunk. And I remember people would come up and were toasting us and saluting us and buying us a drink or two. That's probably why I, why I was in the condition I was in. Certain people on the 11 o'clock news wanted to interview me, and I was pretty loaded. It's a great day for America. We did something very important in this city. We stood up for the First Amendment. It was a great night. So you wake up in a hangover. <laughs> and is your life normal after that? No, not at all. You hope that it will return to being normal. I mean, that's your goal that life will get back to being the way it was. But for me personally, that wasn't working. I guess too much had happened to me personally to just say I could live the way it once was. And early in 1991, the board made it clear to me that they wanted me to leave. So they kind of pushed you out? Oh, yeah, very much so. But I say that, and at the same time, I, I had sort of had it. So Dennis resigned, and then he made a vow to himself. I remember being interviewed by some TV personality. They said, would you ever work for a museum again? And I said, never unless it was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I said it kind of jokingly. And a week or two later, I got a phone call from the headhunter. Absolutely true story. <laughs> would you interview for the job? I remember in my 13 interviews for the job, one of the things that re I really had going for me was my stand against censorship. But Dennis's career wasn't the only thing that didn't return to normal. Museums all over the country looked at what happened to the Contemporary Art Center, the damage to its reputation, their corporate donors deserting them, the expensive legal battle. And they thought to themselves, do we really want to risk going through all that? A great deal of alarm went through the art community and museums throughout the country. They had to come to grips to the fact that they weren't going to be, you know, this exempt category anymore. Sometimes, even though you don't win that lawsuit, the fact that you take somebody to court, sometimes that is a deterrent, all right? And I know in Cincinnati especially, there hasn't been anything that's come back anywhere near that kind of you know controversy, which somewhat surprises me. Because you're talking like, what, what, geez, 28 years ago now? So in some ways, you're kind of like, whoa, you know, it, it did its job. We may not have won the battle, but we feel like we won the war. This episode of Bleeped was produced by me, Matthew Billy. Rebecca Seidel was the editor. In the trial recreation, the role of Judith Reisman was played by Ali Levin. Our theme song was composed by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Huge thanks to Dennis Barry, H. Lewis Sirkin, and Monty Lobb for being our guests. Be sure to subscribe to Bleeped on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter, or visit our website, bleep.org. Thanks for listening.